and let me give it just a few seconds because all right hello and welcome to our latest guest interview on from the ground up this show is partly sponsored by divina skincare and botanicals and i'm carmen milagro i'm an entrepreneur a certified cbd consultant a professional coach I'm the author of Truths About Hemp CBD, a guidebook for curious folks. And I'm the co-founder of CBD University Online and the Blue Moon Gypsies Band, as well as your host. Now, what, is, what do all these things have to do with anything, right? Basically, we all start somewhere and usually in whatever arena or career you're in, most people start from the ground up. So on this show, we look to experts in their fields and we gather advice, strategies, nuggets of wisdom, tips and hacks. And these are from some of the most successful people in different arenas, whether they're authors, consultants, journalists, musicians, tech gurus, industry leaders, celebrities, investors, artists, you name it. And some are all of the above. My guests come from all walks of life, and we talk about all sorts of topics, life, career, uh, business, wellness, family, strategies that come up, and you know, just their advice and take on life. I'm deeply honored to feature Mr. Ed Vargas as our guest today. Ed Vargas is an international speaker, author, consultant, and moderator, and he's been active throughout his career with diversity, equity, inclusion, employee resource, resource groups, strategic planning, marketing, leadership, and collaborations with community groups that make a difference. First in his family to attend college, he graduated with a degree from Santa Clara University. He also completed executive managing publishing programs at Cornell and Northwestern. Ed's also president of Vargas and Associates, a strategic planning, marketing, and communications consulting group. Most recently, and almost single-handedly, Ed has spearheaded the soft launch, the newest Bay Area organization called HLX Plus, and there's so much more to learn about Ed. Ed is also a lifelong musician, something we have in common. He plays guitar and lives with his wife, Christine, in Contra. Costa County. Welcome to the show, Ed. I'm going to bring you on. Welcome. Carmen, good to see you. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today. I know how busy you are. <laughs> uh, yeah, this past Monday when we launched our uh, HLX West Coast Summit hosted by Bill.com, um, that was going, made me revisit the time that I was a uh, uh, publisher, editor, and conference director for uh -huh. Nonwoven's uh, business to business group. Uh -huh. And knowing where all the uh, things have to come together to put on a successful show, uh, that was, uh, again, reminding me that uh, it's not easy and you need to coordinate and be in about 15 places at the same time. So I think I bumped into myself twice <laughs> in that uh, effort, but uh, talking to the people that were attendees there, um, they really appreciated the effort the content, and we can talk a little bit more about that detail going we will. forward. We definitely will. Thank you. I, um, you know, I, I think that this is one of those really exciting projects for me as well, and I'm really excited for the future. But, but before we go there, um, before we get to the work that you do and your accomplishments and and your advice for those that are watching and or listening, um, I'd like our viewers and our listeners to, to learn a little bit more about you on a personal level, if you don't mind. Um, I know you and I recently started working together, well, not recently, over a year or about a year, somewhere there. Um, and we're learning about each other in the, you know, in the sense, but, but if you don't mind, share with us a little bit about growing up here in the in the Bay Area, and especially the importance of being the first person, I believe, right? You're the first person mm -hmm. you're to graduate from college. What is that like? What's that impact? What does that mean? Well, I grew up in San Jose, and that was before it's being called now Silicon Valley for quite a few years. 
Um, and largely at the time, it was a, a, a city and a county, Santa Clara County, had a lot of orchards. Uh, my dad was a uh, World War II veteran. He was a, a radio operator in the Army Air Force. Uh, and one of the things that uh, when he met my mom through her brother, who was also in the service, uh, I grew up in a household where I was hearing all kinds of music. My mom's best friend was from Louisiana. So it was a lot of country and Western music for me growing up. Uh, my dad loved to sing uh, Spanish boleros. Uh, and he wasn't the greatest guitar player, but he was able to bring his voice and play the chords so that he would not only you know entertain the person that he's speaking to, but then when our family got together, I'd have an uncle that would grab a washboard uh, uh, make a bass uh, uh, out of that. And, and then everybody would be drinking and, and having a great time right. uh, and, and walking away from that. That's what always stuck in my heart is that it was about family. It was about people contributing, even if they weren't a, an opera singer or they had a great, great voice, they were just expressing themselves. Exactly. And, and, and that's what I remember growing up. We'd go over to my uh, aunt's house of so my mom's uh, younger sister and we would have friends who played in a band and they would be performing there in our backyard and everybody, cousins, everybody would get together. So, so that's what I grew up with. And then of course my older sister was into rock and roll. So that's where that you know voice came back to me as well. So my brother and I, when we would sing, see my dad's, uh, uh, he also started the first Hispanic chapter for the regular veterans association there. So a lot of his friends who were veterans uh, got together and and they would do fundraisers. They would have dances with featuring uh, Beto Torres and his orchestra. Uh, the music masters were a, a group that was uh, uh, one of the, the groups that they would have on stage. And my brother and I would be off stage just sitting down watching them play. And my, my brother became this amazing percussionist. He'd watched the drummer and he learned how to play timbales and congas. So the two of us growing up together, that seemed to be something that just fit. It just made sense. He was a great drummer. I started learning guitar and and uh, that was kind of the influences. It was about our family. Music was a, a, a core energy that we had. It would always be something at that time. It wasn't I wasn't a performer in front of audiences, but it was something that I felt in my heart. And I could see everybody felt good about that. So, so that was one of the the, the core uh, areas that I that I had growing up. Um, working, my dad worked for a canning canning company, uh -huh. so um, we weren't involved with farm workers indirectly, uh, directly. But when I started working to earn money to go to school, um, I became a forklift driver, and I would be there unloading these crates of fruit they were going to be made into a fruit cocktail and I would just sit there. I was fortunate. It was It could be a hundred degrees and I'd be, you know, with a little bit of shade from the forklift, but it was realizing that the people that picked that fruit were in the hot sun all day. They didn't have the opportunity to go into the shade uh, and come back out and, and do all that and have a nice lunch and finish the day. Uh, so I really appreciated, um, all through the levels of bringing the fruit, growing the fruit with the farmers, people that picked those those uh, uh, crops and put them in a place where they became, you know, product that people would buy in the grocery store. Right. So to me, it was really kind of a grassroots understanding of how the economy in, in the San Jose, Santa Clara area started. Uh, sure. And now it's it's Tech City. Right, exactly. And, and your family must have been so incredibly proud when you graduated from from college, I would imagine. Well, to that point, I mean, that's one of the things that I talk to families now is to look forward and encourage their children to go to college. There's been for many years this concept called imposter syndrome, where people don't feel that they're qualified. Uh, in my case, one teacher, uh, when I was a junior high school, uh, I was a student body president, I played football, other sports, and I, my grades are good. I've just really enjoyed reading and, and learning. Uh, and he suggested, he said, there's this Jesuit high school, you know, why don't you apply? And I had never even heard of this school at the time. So I had a conversation with my parents and they said, sure, mijo, please, you know, we'll apply and, 
and uh, and as fortunate, I, I uh, was uh, accepted. Uh, it was a tuition high school, so in my head, I was kind of thinking, well, I'm going to need to contribute to be able to go to this school. So that kind of built this concept for me of of uh, working to, toward a goal, right. uh, and and then within the Jesuit community there, um, <laughs> when I started playing football as a freshman. That year, uh, the defense was rated the number one defense in the country. They weren't scored on. We had four high school All-Americans. So just even in a sports level, the bar was set pretty high for you to want to continue that. Sure. Uh, playing, playing on a team was just something that I felt good about contributing as much as I could in, in that situation. So that's that's just one of the, the core elements that's been within me is this uh, – concept uh, with the Jesuit community is to try to help other people as often as you can. Right. That's wonderful. And and we'll talk about that some more, right? Because this is this is carrying forward in your life as as we can as we're learning now. Um it if um if you don't mind, I just want to go back to, you know, your you talked about how you grew up, you know, in this joyful, you know, house of celebrations and music. How would you describe the power of music and how, if at all, does any of this transfer into the corporate or the entrepreneurial realm? Sorry about that. Totally forgot. Sure. So, so high level, you know, here I, uh, I am trying to earn money. I was accepted at Santa Clara University and my brother and I were playing in a band uh, uh, and we had an opportunity to play and earn money. I was you know, I could work in the library at four dollars an hour or I could be a musician and get paid fifty dollars an hour. So, yep, that made sense to me. And and what I really identified with it is that playing music as a cover band, not only did I get to play, you know, guess who was in the Bay Area that um, played guitar with a guy named Carlos Santana, right? I think I've heard of him. Yeah. So uh, just to put it in perspective, I when I bought those albums and my brother would listen to them, right. uh, two, two things happened. I, I just had to learn every song on the first three albums just because it made me feel good. Right. Sure. Sure. And then my, my brother, he, not only was he an amazing musician, but he had this artist capability in high school, that first uh, album cover of Santana with the lion's head and yep. inside the face of the lion, you saw that body or that figure. Well, right. he was able to draw that freehand when he was like a sophomore in high school and it looked exactly like that that drawing that was on the cover so he always had that capability and, and that's something i tried to tap into is that when you have music as a performer it taps into your creative side and that's a good compliment to have when you're you know from a law perspective you got to know all the rules and 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 perform in those tests and bring those cases forward but right. but the music side it it brings out that expression that that feeling that you can connect with people. So that that's a, a core strength for me about music. And then as I continued going forward, um, I found that working with organizations, community organizations, uh, you'd have sometimes people that were from the East Coast in a large corporation and where they grew up, they didn't have a lot of diversity. Uh, where they grew up, it was, I, I could remember getting on flights going across the country when I was in uh, first getting in, into business and I'd be sitting next to people on a flight from Chicago or the Midwest and they would be a little bit shocked that here I am Hispanic, you've got a business degree and a law degree. You know, they from what they would see in the media, it was a completely reversal of, you know, you're not a cartel person, you're not a gang member because that's what you see in the media, unfortunately. So to me, I've always seen music as a way, not only that what I enjoy, I would listen to it to relax. If I'm going to go on a sales pitch or in a meeting and I wanted to be at my best, I would listen to my favorite songs. Yeah. But also that experience going to the Midwest or pe meeting people that maybe didn't grow up where I grew up. If they heard music that they would like, as you know, you know, people will get up and want to dance. Right. I, you don't have to say, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, would you please get up and dance to this song? It's like they grab somebody and they're on the dance floor. And and that person that's dancing uh, could be next to 
a CEO or a janitor. It doesn't matter. They could be all different ethnicities. It doesn't matter. They're there in the moment and that power of music to reach people brings people of all ages, all cultures together. Uh, so, so that to me is something as, as a musician, uh, I looked at it. Yep. It's very satisfying to me that I feel I accomplished something to learn a new song right. and play it for myself. There's this energy when you get with a group of other musicians that are like-minded, there's a phrase called in the groove. Right. And so when you're on stage and you're looking at each other, I, I tell musicians, you have to have big ears. You mm -hmm. have to not only understand what you're playing, but what everybody else is doing so you can be in the groove. And then that energy when you've got a live audience in front of you. To me, there's there's nothing like that where it's almost like a back and forth. You know, you're playing and people will get up and dance and they'll say, you know, play this song, play this song. So that that really at a, at a very human level is a way that you can reach people with music. And then if you add food to that, look out. Yeah. Everybody's having a fun time. Well, I love what you said because Ed, it's it's when I'm coaching, when I'm working, especially with young people or, you know, it's particularly with the Latino community, the Hispanic community, young people. I try exactly what you just described. When I talk about this, you know, I give them the examples of art and music help build your self-esteem. Art and music, um, unless you're a solo artist or, you know, but typically in a band setting, it's like building your corporate team. It's like building your, your startup team and engaging with people. It, when you're an artist, Yes, it, of course, sometimes we stumble and we stutter and we make mistakes when we're speaking publicly. But the ability to be able to get up and do that and connect on that human level, to me, that's all a part of music and, and business and entrepreneurial, all of these skill sets, soft skills, whatever you want to call them, but they are interconnected. And it comes back to, in my opinion, education. And if we remove art and music from our children's educations, there's bigger struggles down the road. In exactly. My and and just let me expand on that a little bit. So, okay. so my strength in the way that I've done and approached business, whether it's uh, people, you know, different uh, region of the U.S., right. one of the things that, that – um, touched me when I was a little boy, we would go visit the same aunt that we would go to dance in their backyard. She had a picture of her oldest son who was in the Air Force, and he was in Italy with one of those coliseums in the background. Sure. And growing up in San Jose and really not doing much travel, that was something I made a promise to myself. At some point, I wanted to do business internationally. Uh, and so the opportunity to meet people where they live in a different country and understand that you're visiting them and you need to understand their culture. That to me has always been a core, like a highway, is that how do you present yourself? Well, number one, credibility. You know, you come across straightforward and that can build trust. And when you have credibility and you're building trust, the first thing that I try to do is to give respect. In our Hispanic community, you respect your elders. In other uh, communities, uh, Asian community, you respect your elders. Native Americans, you honor and respect your, your elders. Uh, and you learn from them in that, that capacity. So if you're giving respect, you will get respect back. Correct. And, and the challenge with what I'm seeing with some young people um, there's two things I want to say about that. Number one, if they have not had music, if they have not been in this environment where they've got that creative side working, sometimes it's as simple as them getting on an app and they could spend hours and hours or doing something that takes up their time, but it's not creative in that perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and that limits what they see by opening doors and seeing the next door or having a vision. Sure. So, so the challenge that, that they have by not following that kind of path and presenting themselves that way. Um, some people 
you know, and again, it, it styles and clothing and hairstyles change from, you know, this year to that year. But don't get so caught up in that, that that's what you think you are. You, who you are is in your heart, your mind and your soul. And if all you think is that, oh, my hair's that person's hair is green. I have to have my hair green, too. Um, it's going to be limiting. You'll, you may not know it. But uh, again, there's this phrase, you know, you be you're, you're with your tribe because you feel comfortable because everybody says looks the same in that area. The challenge is where we're at today in our in our society. And it's not just within the U.S. We have people that a lot of it from from social media is polarization. You have people that hold on to what they think they feel and they're not going to listen. They're not going to accept any other information other than their own tribe. And that's the real challenge we have today uh, to be able to present ideas in a way that doesn't intimidate other people, that they can relate to, and they can find a place where let's have a discussion. You know, the world's problems we have right now here in California, you know, we've had many years of drought, you know, and people are always, you know, you go to the grocery store, where's my bananas? Where's my, you know, fruit, vegetables? Well, guess what? With the drought situation where a lot of the food from the country is uh, gets from, from California, uh, several things. We've got a uh, limitation of water. So what crops are still going to get access to that water? Uh, the cost of housing for the farm workers that raise and, and, and uh, harvest those crops, they can't even afford to live where some of these locations are because the cost of rent is so high. So, so again, we, everybody, we have to rethink the definition of the problem and come up with new solutions that could work past and, and, and leverage what we can do or even invent something that hasn't been invented to do it more effectively. And, and that's what, what, what I feel passionate about with this um, collaboration with corporations, community organizations, with young people that have these ideas, that but they don't have the foundation to build on to make that uh, scalable, let's say. Well, and this is the perfect segue to get back to, you know, the event that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I actually met for the first time in person. We've been working and collaborating over Zoom. so. It was really nice to just see you, you know, in person, in 3D. Um, but one of the reasons, you know, that and I don't know if you know this, but one of the reasons that I'm so excited about being included and being a part of our new program, our new organization is your definition, um, your alignment and mine are so similar in that, you know, the definition for me of inclusivity and diversity, it's, I think there's, and I, you are so much more articulate, but there's so many broken spokes on this wheel, the way that I see it, the way that it affects me. And I do think that, that we can fix this, but you mentioned polarization earlier. Can you sort of define for us, you know, what you feel the strength of Hispanic diversity is and what HLX is doing about it? Okay, so high level, there's this uh, app called Ancestry.com. They're an organization uh, here in California in the Bay Area that, that you can learn about your heredity. And they even offer a DNA test. So guess what? I signed up. I did it. And I learned, well, I knew like my uh, fraternal grandmother was 100% Yaqui Native American. Mm -hmm. So I figured that would show up. Uh, my mom's maiden name was Martinez and that, you know, was Hispanic. My dad's name Vargas, you know, that goes back to Spain. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, generally I have an idea, but what are the details around that? Right. So, so from my perspective, I, it was, an awakening that I also have African American blood, mm -hmm. not a lot, but a little bit. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, heredity that goes back with people from uh, uh, Scandinavia, uh, 
as well as the Native American and the, the Hispanic background, which is the majority. Yeah. But, but the point I'm making here is that if everybody did that, you'd find that you're not Mexico 15 generations behind, only uh, marrying somebody who's also Mexican. Guess what? The diversity here in California is amazing. Uh, when I was the uh, head of marketing communications for the World Affairs Council in San Francisco, I would go out at lunchtime and you could hear European tourists that are coming to the Bay Area. You could, and the largest ethnic group in San Francisco is Chinese. So I could walk just to get in a sandwich and come back and I'd, I'd hear six or seven different languages and they're all enjoying visiting San Francisco and what that has to show. So, so to me, I've always had this appreciation for other cultures. I've always engaged uh, with people to understand, hey, you know, I was in uh, um, Japan and having a, a meal with some CEOs at this building up toward this conference that I was developing there. And uh, we were having one of their traditional dishes. They invented sukiyaki. So they were so proud of offering me sukiyaki. Uh, and again, you know, I've had other Asian foods, but you could tell that they wanted to share that with me. And, and that to me is the key, one of the key things that are missing when we're talking to people of different cultures is that it's all about me, me, me. Well, you're not like me. So end the conversation, you know, what, why aren't you like me? Why aren't, and then to the, the, to the thing about imposter syndrome, there's the reverse of that too. The other side of that same coin is that people, some people, feel that the way they feel better about themselves is to put somebody else down. So I grew up in the San Jose, Santa Clara area, which is largely Mexican American, mm -hmm. but working in San Francisco, the predominant Hispanic groups that were there were Central American. So, you know, a pupusa, I didn't have a pupusa growing up in San Jose, but that was something that was very popular in San Francisco because there were a lot of Central American. Oh, you like, you heard of that? Well, Salvadorian, so. There you go. That, so, so that to me is like, again, going back to music and food, here's a way that people, you know, can enjoy something together and having that collaborative relationship. Yeah. Then you can build on that as opposed to, no, don't tell me this or I can't, I don't believe this, you know. Let's, let's just deal with each other at a human level. So, so that's one of the things that it's been a strength for music for me to reach people. It's a way to present, you know, ideas to get other people that they accept, understand, and they want to help, you know? No, I love this. And I think this is why I enjoy talking to you so much is because we, we really are in alignment. And it's nice when you do meet someone else that has these same ideas. I just got back um, this past weekend doing the the keynote uh, sort of facilitator uh, guest judge role for the Indigenous Film uh, Makers Retreat. And this was the topic that we talked about, you know, and I, I like you, I, I didn't, well, let me backtrack a little bit. I didn't know what imposter syndrome was. And I've said this before on the show when I talked to Jesse, I think, and someone else. Um, I, I really didn't know what that meant. And I'm not trying to dismiss it or, or, or disarm it. I think it's, a, it's an experience that people feel and it should be acknowledged and, and we should work on that. But for me personally, I didn't know what that meant because of all these different things that you talked about, being an artist, having someone, and even if it's only one person in your corner who supports you and encourages you to be who you are, I've never experienced walking into a room or a meeting or a restaurant or on stage and thinking that I didn't belong. Now, some people may take offense at what I just said. They may think, oh my God, she's so arrogant. But I would I would dispute that in a in the way by saying, but if we teach everyone, if we encourage everyone and support each other, there would be no such thing as imposter syndrome. 
Yeah. So let me give you an example going back again growing up. So my youngest, my younger brother, Steve, who was again this amazing artist, you know, percussionist, um, he was born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate. And that meant he had several operations, even as a toddler, right. just so that they could close those areas and he would have a roof of his mouth. And um, so for me, being the older brother, uh, it was something as we were going to the same elementary school, I found that some kids, you know, not as a kindergarten or first grade, but as they got, you know, in the more elementary school, you know, kids hang out together and some would make fun of the way he enunciated words. That's something if you've not had that experience before, think of how you would make sounds and vowels and things when you don't have that same feeling that people people have. So when we would, I would be out there at lunchtime or recess, rather than always being with my buddies and things, I would kind of take a walk around where the younger you know students were, my, my younger brother, and if there was anybody that was trying to bully him, you know, I didn't have to get into a fight. Sure. I would just confront them right. and call them out saying, you know, you see me and, and you, I'm bigger than you. Now, because you're making fun of him, I could do something to you. But the most important thing is understand is that there's always going to be somebody bigger than you. And you do not have that as a right to bully other people. I don't know what, you know, what your family, your background is, sure. but you need to stop this. So it was never a, a physical confrontation, but I wanted to make them think that this isn't an acceptable behavior. Right. And, and if they wanted to push it, I'd be back. Right. You know, so, so that, that was one of the things that just kind of gave me this awareness that there are people that either for some disability or something that they're working through or a mindset that they don't feel that they fit in. And unfortunately, there are people that will tell them that you don't fit in because of this or that. So so that to me was just a core issue. Um, and then the flip side of it, where I played football once uh, as, a, as a senior, we were playing one of the top rated schools in the state. And I was looking at this book about high school prep, you know, athletes. And I knew that I would be going up against a man named Willie Viney, who was about 100 pounds heavier than me and a few inches taller than me. Uh -huh. And and I knew that, OK, that in that game, I'm going to that's who I'm going to be blocking against and try to keep him from getting to our quarterback. And, and in the first half, uh, I felt I was on roller skates. I was every strength, every ounce of my strength. I was trying to keep him out. But he was that much bigger and stronger than me. So, you know, as it turns out, okay, we go back to second half and I'm still every play trying my hardest. And guess what? I was in better shape than he was. So even though he was bigger, <laughs> you know, that's the sound that he was making in the second half. So I was able to hit him with the same, you know, force and actually move him backward. And I had the impression not only was I doing my job, but that's the first time that's ever happened to him. Um, and so as it turns out, it was a very, very close game. Uh, we won the game. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we, we were on a bus, we were up there and again, you know, Jesuit, you know, high school, we had, you know, like our sport coat on and our ties. That's how we would go to these games. And as we're boarding the bus, we get surrounded by the people and the students there at that school. Uh -huh. They are not used to losing. They were rated to be like one of the best teams in the state. And that's where they thought they should be. Right. And we beat them in that game. Right. Uh, and it wasn't looking good for a while because they were surrounding the bus. Yeah. And we thought, OK, you know, how's this going to end? And guess what happened? Willie Viney comes out <laughs> and he tells everybody around the bus, this isn't the right way to do this. They beat us fair and square. Uh -huh. And he basically told everybody else to disperse and go back home. You know, we'll have another game next week and then come out and check us out then. And I could see Willie talking to him and he turned around at the bus and he looked right at me and he went like this and I went like that back to him. So again, sportsmanship, yes. that one-to-one -one situation, I was up against somebody that was much bigger, stronger than me, but 
the way that I was in shape and the way that, you know, as he got better through that, that season, he got in better shape, but just being that big, he didn't have to do that. He thought right. because he could just knock people over. Right. Uh, so that respect, that self-respect of how we connected as individuals, that addressed that problem. And that's something I kept with me my whole life is that, you know, even when it looks like it's a difficult situation or you fall down, get up and try it again. And, and that perseverance, that tenacity is something that uh, I would encourage. And I'll be I'll be talking to some young kids uh, at a K through eight bilingual school this Friday up in San Rafael. And, and I'll ask them to spell the word tenacity. And I'll give them a little bit of this kind of story to say that, you know, you just can't fall back and say, well, I'm not going to get up again or I'm not going to. I can't do this. Unfortunately, um, there are more and more suicides at the college and even younger now where kids that, again, you know, they haven't been put in a difficult situation and given uh, a direction or have that inner strength to work through it. As you said, you know, you grew up thinking, you know, I belong at the table, I, I'm in the meeting. It's yeah. it's never been an issue for me. But yeah. for those kids that have don't have that that perspective, they're the ones that are being defeated. They feel, you know, you know, well, I did this. How come it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to be? Sure. You know, so so that's an issue that I've also been uh, dealing with uh, at some level, just to try to talk to students um, at Santa Clara University last year for Hispanic Heritage Month, I was hosting a webinar with a young lady who had been a DACA student. Right. And she, uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so so from that perspective, when we were getting set up to do the, the webinar to address the people on campus, it was a partnership with the DE&I department, the uh, Latinx uh, Research Center, and the undergraduate uh, group, um, the professor that was helping set up, set us up said, oh, if you see a student, um, they might be depressed because somebody committed suicide this past weekend. Mm-hmm. And, and when I heard that, it shocked me at Santa Clara University. And, and then I found out, I looked it up on, on, the, uh, on uh, Google, there were actually three suicides that fall semester last year. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what, what could have possessed them to see that here they're in this great school, this great learning environment, but that's what they did, you know. Right. So yeah. Me, I, 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 the people that had helped support that that uh, webinar, I, the leaders there at Santa Clara, I gave them a report that Salesforce had put together, mm-hmm. and it was addressing um, uh, education institutions, other colleges, universities, saying, "Hey, from COVID." people have been isolated and there are issues around wellness and they were recommending, here's a way that you could have a wellness center on your campus. Uh, And so I sent that to them and I said, it's not just wellness for the students, but COVID has hit everybody. So it's the faculty as well. So Santa Clara now has a wellness center on campus and it's a place where if kids, you know, can drop in, they can connect, they can talk to people. They can, you know, have a counselor help them through it. Uh, but it's, again, having that isolation when you're dependent on uh, right. a right. communication level that all of a sudden you're deprived of. That, to me, is like kids never had to deal with that before. No one's ever had to deal with COVID. Right. So how do we help each other get through this challenge? And again, once again, the alignment and the work that you do, I so admire it. I, I you know, as a confident strategist, as a coach, as a you know, consultant, those are the areas that are most important to me. And I think that the work that you do, that's why mentorship programs and and doing these kinds of videos where anyone can watch this on their own time, if it resonates with them, if it helps one person, Mm -hmm. this conversation that we're having, that's why I do this. You know, that's why it's so important for me to continue to do this because the insights that you're bringing to this conversation, Ed, it's so important. And if it's one one kid, you know, one college student, one high school senior that sees this, and maybe, just maybe, they look for more resources or the light bulb, you know, the switch goes on. And 
if if we can do this on a greater platform, I'm all for exactly. it. We work on that too. <laughs> yeah. So if we can talk a little bit later if you'd like the the, the meeting that we had on Monday. Yes. Uh, we were talking about Conectado. Yes. It's a new you know software platform that Guillermo Diaz Jr. has put together. And oh yes, he's got a little tech background. He was the CIO at Cisco for a while, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> he might know a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, and then and then um, again, the people that hosted us there at Bill.com, they're a software in the cloud company that provides financial services for small and medium sized businesses. And and one of the things that they did, um, there's a relationship at Cristo Ray in San Jose, they're a Jesuit boys and girls school. Mm -hmm. And um, G is on the, Guillermo, G is on the um, uh, board of directors there for Cristo Rey. And so is Sal Chavez, Chava. And so from that perspective, they created a coding camp inviting high school students, boys and girls from Cristo Rey and Bill.com people there, they had them go through two weeks of training on how coding works and they built and created their own app and not only did they do it successfully but they those kids that are in that class now see themselves as a potential tech person exactly. and and so you know again one of the, the other subjects we talked about was farm workers were doing all that hard work make maybe 24 25,000 dollars a year right uh, and in that kind of training, these Crystal Ray students could not only they're getting paid to be an intern. So in this program, they're going to school four days a week. And on the fifth day, they're at Bill.com as a paid intern working on apps and software. Yeah. So they, they not only get rewarded, but they're incentive. They're, they've got an incentive to do this at another level. So. Again, Bill.com says if you once you graduate and get your degree, you have a job waiting for you here at Bill.com. And and they said, you know, well, if you would be a, a first year, you know, college grad starting at a tent company, you're one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year versus, you know, the other options or kids don't see an option. Correct. So, so they don't align themselves. Um, so so that was one of the key reasons we wanted to do this summit there at bill.com is to show these programs and say you can you know be part of this we need to develop this in other parts of the country so right now actually as we speak g and shava are in houston talking to students at rice university to get them understanding what this is about Uh, so you know this is something called hispanic heritage month but uh it really is an opportunity for us to do this year round. And, and that's how I feel, how strongly I feel about, you know, putting my my attention now. I used to work for this startup tech company called AT&T for about 20 years. Uh, <laughs> and the last 10 years I was in their e-commerce platform. So the metrics and analytics, and, you know, when you grow by acquisition, they bought Singular, they bought these other telecommunications companies uh, that from an IT or a back end perspective, you know, I was working with, uh, people that we would do the analytics on how successful or where those gaps were. And we, you know, constantly kind of keep redoing uh, some some coding so that it would be more effective because it's not just on the iPhone, it's on the laptop. It's on all these different devices that may read that code differently. So that was that was an area of mine. And, and I definitely, you know, want to encourage with the the numbers we have with Hispanics. So high level over 62 million people in the US that are Hispanic, that's our consumer base. Correct. When you take a look at uh, gross domestic product or GDP, um, really, you know, about two years ago, the data that came out from the, uh, the Latino Donor Coalition mm-hmm. uh, was showing that we were the, as a segment, if you took Hispanics out of the US and looked at that segment, we were the eighth largest GDP in the world. Well, they just launched their latest report and their latest data shows now we've moved up to the fifth largest GDP in the world. That's a big jump. We were, we've got a greater GDP than India, than France, 
Um, so, so to that point, you know, if you're a business person at a company like Nike and you sell those products, if I'm a marketing person, what's the biggest growth segment that I could work with? Hispanic consumers. By, by uh, the numbers, Hispanic families are younger yeah. with more children than the average American family. So again, you know, when you talk about how do you reach people, um, Hispanics, you know, if they embrace something like my family, uh, you're loyal. You know, you want to stand up for your family. So right. it, it's been a key message to companies like Nike, you know, IBM, Procter & Gamble, that they see that their growth segment is the Hispanic consumer. So the things that they could do to hire more Hispanics, train more Hispanics, and there's a real gap in the boardroom with Hispanic representation. And I'm saying for both male and female. Right. To me, to me, there's, you know, you know, you're a successful entrepreneur. Uh, you've never felt that issue that an imposter syndrome, but for many women in the workforce, Latinas, that's something that they've had to overcome. Right. And so, so to me, that was one of the reasons, again, we had uh, gender equity as one of the topics that we had right. uh, uh, on, our, on our conference this past Monday. So right. the numbers in the Bay Area, for example, we were in you know, Silicon Valley, the tech capital of the world. Right. Uh, if you're a white uh, tech person, a Caucasian male, you know, you earn this much money a year, let's call it 150,000 or 200, whatever that amount is, right. but a woman doing exactly the same work doesn't earn as much money. And, and a Latina would have to literally work to the following year, December, to earn the same amount that the other gentleman got the year before. Right. So that pay disparity, I know I was at an event where uh, there was a lady from Verizon, and she was proud to say there is pay equity at 100% with women and versus men. So there is no gap. Uh, Salesforce uh, in San Francisco has also now given an incentive to the managers mm -hmm. to make sure that in terms of people that they're hiring, as well as the pay levels of people, have that, that parity. So that's a, a metric that as a manager, as a director, you know, they'll get additional financial incentive to reduce that current disparity from wherever they're at. At this point in time, this is where we want to be next year. Here's where we want to be a year after that. There's also an organization called the uh, ASER, their Hispanic Association for Corporate Responsibility. So I would recommend people, you know, go to their website, download that report because they get companies across the U.S. filling out surveys as to where they stand with DE&I, how they are approaching these issues and gaps. And, and to me, it's always about best practices. You know, if, if you're playing with good musicians and you're doing a gig here, you get hired at the next gig. Somebody right. says, you've got to hire these people. They're really good. So that's the same idea here is that if you can learn from best practices and implement that in your own organization, you know, you're bringing the best band forward. I love it. And I love how you just wrap this all up full circle, just the nice, perfect bow. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I didn't have to do anything. Um, I know that you are really, really busy. And so um, I think before we wrap up, if you don't mind, I have this little segment that I call the rapid fire segment. It's just a couple of questions. We'll maybe do three questions today or, or two questions, depending. And it's a question designed so that it's just whatever immediately just first pops into your head without okay. thinking about it. Um, and and if there's something that you don't want to answer, you just say pass and we move on to the next one. So do you mind if we do that real quick? Before sure. Our, sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. I've got 10 questions here to choose from. If um, OK. What do you think about the word retirement? <laughs> uh, okay, so my wife uh, retired as a pediatric director at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, and for me, it's not about the last job that I had. It's about, you know, I get so much 
uh, out of helping other people. And that could be, you know, one of the things that I enjoy with my grandson, who'll be eight in November, is that I'm teaching him how to play guitar. Um, I spend time, of course, with um, I'm the, a mentor with the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship because helping entrepreneurs that focus on poverty or uh, helping the environment, helping them scale up, uh, I enjoy that. Uh, so I got reconnected with that group. And I'm also working on a, a toolkit for unconscious bias because even with mentors and, and successful entrepreneurs, sometimes there's a challenge in being able to, to connect. So basically the answer is what is retirement? <laughs> There's no such oh, thing. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been there yet, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, who's your favorite artist and why? Well, let's in the music category, I would have to say because I'm a guitar player <laughs> and I grew up listening to Carlos Santana and I bought a Gibson SG because I wanted to sound like Carlos Quintana, Santana. Uh -huh. Uh, I'd say he's my favorite artist for a, a number of reasons. Not only uh, can he play, but his approach to music, it's been about layering Afro-Latino percussion with his heart that he's reached out to Miles Davis. He's played with amazing artists and it's fusion. When I hear Santana, and, and most people, if you've heard his, his song, all you have to hear is like the first four or five notes of his guitar. That's Carlos Santana. Right. So, so that to me is someone that I respect that he's lived his life to the fullest. He's reached and has encouraged people to come together using the power of music. So, so he's been, you know, and he's still performing today. Uh, so, so that to me is, is, is a, when it comes to an artist in the music field. That's wonderful. I have one more for you before we go. What brings you joy? When I see change in a, in a positive way, when I've seen, you know, there have been gaps or I've seen that um, these people aren't at the table and being able to enable that to change, that brings me joy. That makes me feel like I'm worthwhile, that, you know, the skills that I've learned that I'm sharing that. And there's this expression where, you know, you climb the ladder of success with one hand and you bring somebody else up with the other. That's, that's what makes me feel, you know, good at the end of the day is to encourage other people to do that. Not just me, but the more people I can get to do that, you know, then it becomes, you know, familiar, you know, it's, that's, that's the thing that I try and get across to Hispanics out there at, at uh, on Monday's event is that, we're all familiar. We're all, you know, associated together. Let's partner together. Let's use technology in a positive way uh, to help each other up. Yes. And thank you for that leadership, Ed. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I really, really appreciate every time we have these conversations. I learn something new. You just, you just reinforce everything that I I stand for, that I believe, that I strive for. So thank you for all of that. Before I let you go, though, people will probably want to reach out to you. You know, they're going to be listening to this. They're going to be watching this. How can they connect with you? And if you wouldn't mind just one, you know, one takeaway that you want everyone to, to walk away with, you may have just shared it. But if you have another one, that's great. <laughs> well, to the younger audience, I would I always say dream big. You know, you know, I, I've worked with students, high school students with something called High Tech Day at AT&T, where I would give them a paper with front and back. And I'd say, what's your vision? Where do you want to be in five years? Not me telling you you're going to get this job, but where do you want to be with five years? So that's your vision. And then I have them write down their goals to see that vision. And then from their goals, they set objectives and a timeline, strategies, and then top down that drives their activity as to where they need to spend their time. So I, I tell younger people, dream big. Uh, for me, again, it's this people need to relate to each other at a very basic human level. So, you know, helping my older sister, you know, who's kind of having issues with dementia, that that's something she needs and she's part of my family. So I try to help her with that. When it comes to 
getting technology in a place where younger people can appreciate and thrive in that environment. That's something I love that. And then somebody you know says needs a guitar player. Our, our guitar player is sick. There I am. I'm sitting in for that group. <laughs> oh, great. And how can people connect with you, Ed? They can reach me probably the best on LinkedIn. So if you look up my name on LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect with you on that level. Great. Thank you so much. Again, I've just thoroughly enjoyed this once again. You, you've given me some great ideas, some great insight. I appreciate you so much. I know we're going to have another meeting soon uh, for all the work that we want to do together in the future. And yes. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Ed. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Carmen. Thank you so much. And thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today. You know, as I've said before, the transformational success, it starts from the truth, from the ground up, from the inside out. Who are you as a human being will really be the core of who you become and how you build your success. And hopefully, for me, there's no reason that you can't lead with your heart. And when you do that and you help others, just like Ed was saying, you help others, you do something good for, for the planet, for your community, that to me weaves into my definition of success. And I wish you all the success in the world. I hope that you enjoy a beautiful, healthy life filled with joy and music and, and success, whatever that means to you. Um, this has been From the Ground Up sponsored in part by Davina, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.